Hello everyone, this is John from RPGs and More, and in today's video, I'd like to discuss a topic, and the topic is drinks. So it's kind of similar to what we were talking about the past two times, uh, currency first and then food, and how these things might be used to enrich a campaign. So let's talk about drinks. We've got two different categories of drinks. We're going to start with water or other non-alcoholic drinks, and then we can go to wine or other alcoholic drinks and how these things might affect your game and, and ways to make them more interesting than just, oh, it's you know something on the menu at the local pub. Okay? Well, let's examine the non-alcoholic drinks first. The first thing that we want to remember, water, water everywhere, but nary a drop to drink. It's a line from a very famous poem. But it's also a truism during the medieval era. There was water everywhere. A lot of people didn't drink it because it, it, there was bacteria in it, there were, um, you know, parasites in the water. Almost everyone would drink a sort of alcoholic water, water that was half ale. It was, kind of, it was sometimes referred to as a small beer. And this was created because the process of brewing the small beer would sterilize the water and get rid of the things that made people sick. And so they would do this even without necessarily realizing that that's exactly the process that was going on. They just knew that it worked. And, and it worked for a long time. And it's something that was utilized by the common people as well as the nobility. Water was uh, fresh, clean water was something of more of a rarity than what we expect today. Today, you can walk into any corner store or um, convenience store and you can buy a bottle of what you believe to be fresh and clean water. And thanks to the Food and Drug Administration of the United States or whatever country that you come from, uh, we, we have some safeguards to ensure that that water is as clean as the company says it is. In a lot of fantasy settings, you may not have an administration that is set up specifically to make sure that things are fresh and clean. So, how can that be used in your game? The quest for fresh water is an important thing in any game or in any setting really towns and villages would be built around a water source that was actually potable and if they couldn't find one they wouldn't build it so you could have a setup where you are uh, some characters who are trying to establish a fresh new village in a strange new land that maybe your maybe your characters kind of won this land by defeating a bunch of uh, local monsters or creatures or you know a rival tribe of kobolds or whatever you want to say. And now it's their job to build a keep or a castle and claim the land in the name of their, their liege or in their own name. Maybe they're starting their own kingdom or their own home. So they can have a goal outside of like, let's find the most defensible position um, because that's kind of a default of a lot of people. But a lot of people tend to think about combat uh, first or they think about aesthetics. Let's find the prettiest place. They don't always think about, where's the water? And that's something that you as the DM can work with. Figure out, is that stream or that river fresh? Is there anything upriver that can make that water spoiled and bad? Are there a lot of animals up there 
that w whose uh, feces would poison the water further down if the water wasn't filtered, because water's not going to be filtered. Uh, are there other bits of nature that could cause a problem? Are there a lot of fish in this this uh, this stream or this river that might pollute the river eventually with their afoul? Are there other towns, centers of industry uh, further up? Maybe there's a mine further up that might make it a problem. So you've got to think about all these things and think about the ecological outcomes of where you have placed things on your map. If you've got uh, a bunch of mines high up in a mountain close to where this the stream starts they can use that that stream or that river in order to help them with their process of of you know sorting through the ore and sifting through it to find the things that they need but that's going to affect the water going downstream and so there could be an adventure where you've got a mining company up there and they haven't done anything wrong they, they're not, maybe they're not greedy, horrible people. Maybe they just didn't realize that, you know, there's this new village that's growing, you know, downstream of where they are, and people are suddenly getting sick. Or it's a, it's a city or a town that's been there for a long time, and, and this new mine has opened up, and suddenly people are getting sick. That could be a thing. And that could be an adventure of trying to find a way to uh, allow the miners to continue their work while keeping the water fresh for the people and maybe maybe the the process is you know find a different way to mine or they can find a way to somehow filter the water uh, before it leaves the mining area or before it gets to the village you've got magic you can actually kind of mess with a lot of this stuff using magic and use that to inspire yourself and and you can create modern solutions to medieval problems thanks to magic and imagination. I don't see why not. Have fun with it. Don't let it be a, like, this is not purely historical and so it will never work. Like, no, nah, that's for, if you're playing a purely historical game, then yes, you want to do that. If you're like, we're going to be hardcore historians, like, you know what, it, not my jam, but go for it, man. You do you, all right? Um, but if well, we're having fun with it and we've already got magic in our situation or even just the slight bits of fantastical, why not have some way to filter as long as it makes a reasonable amount of sense? It should be doable, right? Just maintain verisimilitude and you're fine. Uh, all right. Milk, another common drink. Now, here's the, here's the thing, though. I could be wrong, but if my memory serves, drinking the milk of creatures, specifically cows for the most part, although goats also were a thing, that's a European thing. That wasn't very common. It wasn't, I, if I recall correctly, it's not something that people in other areas in the world really did a whole lot of. They might use the milk in their cooking from time to time, but like drinking it just like, oh, let's get me a, a mug of this milk, la, 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 and, and cheese and all these things. That's more of it. It seems like it's more of a European thing. And if, if I'm wrong, and you know that I'm wrong because you're from one of those other cultures, non-European cultures, and you're like, we have a long cheese tradition going back from so many years, tell me, please. I would love to actually have that conversation with somebody, and you can point me to some sources, because I, I, I would love to just, you know, if you've got some documentaries or something, I'd, I really would enjoy learning how different cultures uh, engaged with dairy outside of the European envelope. I know that sounds kind of weird, but it's it's that's one of the ways one of the reasons why I find a lot of these topics of conversation interesting because there are a lot of different ways that problems can be tackled. But my experience has predominantly been with the European method uh, because that's my own ancestry, that's my own background. I am a you know Caucasian male who has uh, ancestry from Ireland and England and Scotland and Wales, so. Yeah, that's where my experience comes from. That's where my knowledge comes from. But that doesn't mean that's the only thing I'm interested in. Please share. I would love to hear about it. All right, enough deviation. So, milk. From the udder to the table. As a short-lived product. That is a short-lived product. 
we are looking at a matter of hours unless you have refrigeration. And in the average medieval society, going by historical norms, refrigeration outside of an area that's already pretty arctic ain't happening. Now, let's throw a little magic in there, little cooling spells here and there. You know, you've got a druid, you've got a cleric, or maybe you've got a mage who just really likes ice cream. Why not? But make it make sense. So maybe there is a mage out there who really likes cold dairy products. And so that mage is going to spend a lot of their time coming up with these spells, casting these spells specifically to create a refrigeration system that will function and allow them to enjoy their frozen confections. What would that do to the local economy? What would that do to the local people? Suddenly, imagine a, a medieval society that suddenly has access to ice cream. And imagine that sudden realization because it's so sweet. It's new. It's novel. And But that comes from milk. That's connected to milk. You can't have ice cream without milk, without cream. Um, so think about those connections. Milk itself is a wonderful drink. And if we can find it, if you can figure out a way to allow it to be preserved or chilled so that it stays good longer, then you're, you're in a good spot. Otherwise, most likely it's going to be turned into cheese. And that's okay too. And if you want to have a thriving cheese, uh, production area in your fantasy world, why not? But that's a topic, another topic of how to, how, you know, talking about food. Excuse me. Pardon me. So let's talk about fruit juices. Now, a fruit juice is also something that tends to want refrigeration. But it's, I don't think, I could be wrong, I don't think it demands it as quickly as milk does. But how do we get a fruit juice? Well, a fruit juice is kind of neat because as long as the fruit's good, then you can juice the fruit and make your fruit juice. So all you need is an appropriate supply chain area or roads in order to have the fruit brought from one place to another in a short enough time that it's still going to be good. So if you've got roads that will do this, or if you've got rivers and a thriving trade of, you know, small trade boats out going up and down the rivers from the port to, you know, your little mining village way up there in the mountains, you can actually have these fruit juices travel from place to place in the form of the fruit itself and that makes the fruit even more valuable because you've got you can do uh, several things with it at this point you've got the fruit that can be turned into juice you've got the fruit that can be turned into seeds to try to grow the trees locally which some of them may not survive because maybe they're not used to a colder climate maybe they will and suddenly your noble is going to the local nob nobility could be known as the only people that get to drink orange juice and then the servants that work in that castle sometimes get a little taste of orange juice for themselves, and that's like a mm, mm, a good thing. Maybe they actually uh, produce enough to be able to sell it at local markets, and so you've got a town or a village that is known for orange juice, and people talk about it, and your characters are going to hear about it, and, they're, and your players will recognize what it is, and they might get excited if they like orange juice. Now, if, if you know your players like a different kind of juice, then you can kind of sneak it in and have some fun with that. Be like, yeah, like, you know, like avocados, mm, you know, or celery juice. Ah, you know, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But these things are options. Let's look at other things that can be done with them. Outside of that, we're also looking at ciders. Now, you can have a non-alcoholic cider or an alcoholic cider, but let's look at the non-alcoholic ones for right now. 
Not an uncommon thing, especially in cold climates, because ciders are easier to make and store over a winter time, if I remember correctly. And they also just, when you warm them up, they warm up nicely and they taste really good when heated. So a cider is another option to look into at, as a non-alcoholic drink that you can have served at your local, you know, your party's local pub. And uh, then that actually is an important thing to know about. And one of the reasons why I emphasize so many non-alcoholic drinks and talk about it is because maybe you're running your games at a school or for kids and you want options that don't include alcohol to offer these characters because maybe your school uh, either is requiring you to not use alcohol or you're concerned that they may come down if they are on you and want to stop the, your role-playing game club or other activities if they think that you're modeling a lifestyle that is inappropriate for minors. Uh, this can also be pertain if you are running your game for a, a church's youth group. Uh, let's look at non-alcoholic varieties of things to encourage people to look into other stuff. So ciders are great. So we've talked about water, we've talked about milk, we've talked about fruit juice, we've talked about cider. Uh, let's also look into coconut milk and almond milk. Now these are things that we, we know of now and use now because... Uh, we are modern people and we have a lot of technology and machines that are capable of doing these things. But as long as we've got magic, then it's perfectly reasonable for us to say, hey, let's figure out a way to milk those almonds. Hmm? 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 Magical spells can do that like that. And suddenly these almonds are now milk. If... If you are interested in that kind of route and you want to provide something different, then maybe there is a mage's guild and maybe that's how they make their money. Why? Because almond milk, to a certain extent, can be stored without being refrigerated. And now you've got a milk-like drink that your merchants can take and sell across your nation without having to panic and go fast. So that it requires less uh, outlay of resources from them. It's going to stay good longer. They can take it further and get better prices for it. Um, if you have the means to do it at a reasonable you know, cost, per se, for your campaign, if, if your people can figure that out, then you have a tool, either as a party or as a DM, in order to introduce something fun and different, and it's non-alcoholic. And the same goes for things like soy milk and other, you know, any other like nut milks. You want to like find, find ways to turn things into milk or juice that aren't normally done. You can do that. We've got like pomegranates, oranges, apples, uh, you know, you, grape juice. Why not? Um, you've, you can juice celeries. I mean, any, like anyone who's got a, uh, a juicer knows that almost anything you throw on that that's basically a fruit is eventually going to turn some kind of juice. Even a banana will turn out juice eventually. At least it's kind of like marsh, but it may not be the most appetizing thing, but it's there. And so take that and you've got some amazing stuff. Now, ice is also something that's going to be important for drinks. And ice is a bit more of a challenge, unless you are someone who has spells that will allow you to create ice on command. And then we can talk about the whole idea of ca does casting wall of ice or ice wall or whatever, do, are, do those uh, ice creations persist or do they vanish when the spell ends? Um, same with like, you know, frostbite and any other kind of spell that creates an ice effect. You're like, well, the, can, can this persist or does it vanish with the magic? I usually rule that it vanishes when the magic duration ends unless the spell states otherwise. But you don't have to be me. And if you were like, I really want to have ice in my world because I like the idea of having ice in my drinks, mm -hmm -hmm, then do that because it's cool and it's awesome, and I like it. Um, 
and hopefully your players will like it too right so but let's say you want to keep this to a purely uh, non-magical stance how can you get ice well what you would need to do is you would need to have expeditions that would go into an arctic area and they would cut ice from this arctic area and they would pack it in these big crates surrounded by layers and layers and layers of i think sawdust if i remember correctly excuse me and then they would take these crates and they would run them in carts down the hills into the cities and castles in the the nearby areas where the ice would then be distributed to the wealthy and uh, in these ice boxes and anyone who could really afford an ice box would be able to get a hunk of ice which would then be stored in the ice box again surrounded by lots of straw and or sawdust and then you could go in and chip off little bits of ice as you needed them until the block was gone that's a process that you can do there's no reason why a medieval society couldn't fulfill this process all they would need is the idea and the idea can be provided by the player characters or it can be provided by the dm you like you know you have any kind some kind of scenario where this can happen why not it's a fantasy world enjoy yourself if if you want ice if you want your characters to be able to drink you know an ice latte I mean, there's ways to do it. We just got to use the magic or, or use the practicality to just think of how would we make this latte system work using Renaissance technology. It's not that hard. It's not impossible. It just means that it's something that is reserved for the wealthy. But let's face it. Once your player characters, once their PCs have gotten to a certain level, and they're starting to be able to carry around a couple hundred gold pieces in a pouch although why they're carrying a couple hundred gold pieces in a pouch and not being completely laden down i'm not sure coins are heavy um <coughs> they're among the wealthy you may like to think that they're the scrappy little guy who's you know like just trying to make it on their own no 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 uh-uh fam sorry uh you can if you can throw around a hundred gold pieces that's uh, the equivalent of what is it? Uh, Ten gold pieces is a thousand dollars. A hundred gold pieces is ten thousand dollars. If you can throw around a hundred gold pieces, and you know, not always blink at it, you're the one percent. And I think that adventurers that have earned that through going through these dungeons and risking their lives ought to be able to enjoy some of the finer things in life, including ice in their drinks. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's look at some of the alcoholic drinks. I'm not going to spend as much time in this, mostly because alcoholic drinks are huge, and I could spend a whole video just on those, but I'm not sure yet I really want to. You do have your standard ale and wine and whiskey. Uh, those, those are kind of three standards. And they're easy to do. Ale brewed everywhere since the beginning of recorded history. I mean, almost every nation that I'm aware of has something that we can call ale or beer. It's in a lot of places, especially during early years, it served as both drink and food. Why? Because there's hops, there's wheat, there's whatever in there. It's food. All right. Nothing wrong with that. Now, how can that connect to your adventuring story? Well, you well you can have the classic, you know, this town is really known for this drink. That's a cool a cool tale. I mean, Critical Role has used that as uh, the beginning to some drama as you've got a bunch of different uh, you know breweries in one town and they're kind of playing off of each other there's a little infighting there's some competition it's not all of it's wholesome um, and I think that's a cool way to start a campaign to kind of get people into this groove is like hey you know you've got these these rival brew houses what do you what are you gonna do with that are you gonna play them off of each other are you going to pick one and be loyal to that one hmm what are you going to do? Maybe you'll do nothing. You'll ignore it and move on. But that's all right, because it's a 
a plot point that you've thrown out to your players to see if they're interested. If they're not interested, then you know and you don't worry about it and you move on to the next plot point to see if they're interested in that one. So that's beer. Pretty ubiquitous, uh, easy, to, easy to do, have fun with it. There's a lot of different kinds of beers. There's a lot of different places in the world that have different types of beer uh, that based on location and variance, um, based on you know what they what kind of crops they have in that area you can really go to town with it if you really want to you don't have to but it can be fun and of course uh, it can be really neat in order to use that to make a, each location kind of special so you can imagine for example maybe a dwarven ale is like a guinness and you can describe it that way to your players and if your players have had a guinness before then they're like oh I know what you're talking about. Cool. And and they're going to have more fun with that. And and you can describe it that way if you want, or you can describe a, a thicker, darker flavor and kind of get into more finer detail with that. You can have fun with it. Whatever, you, whatever works for your table. How about wine? In our society, we are used to the idea that wine is made from grapes, right? That's kind of like our thing. Technically, not really true. Wine can be created from the distillation of any fruit. So you can have banana wine, you can have apple wine, you can have, I mean, you could probably have orange wine, although that would taste, I imagine that would taste funny, but that's me. Uh, someone here may have had it, you know, wine made from oranges, tell me, what do you think? You can have all these different things. Pomegranate wine, that would be interesting one. I'd, I. Uh, I think I'd like to try that. Or, um, what was that? Not beets. Um, anyway, I'll think of it at some point. But all the, but you know, all these different things can be used to make wine. And so you can actually vary your wines up and have each region be known for a different type of wine based upon what fruits are available in that region. And so you can have adventurers sent on a quest. Let's say the local nobility has a wedding coming up that's really special and they want something special to serve to their guests. So they're going to hire some local go-getters to say, hey, I want you to go across that ocean there on that ship that you own and go over to that town that I know is over there, and I want you to get me, you know, 10 cases of banana wine, and then bring it back. And here's half of the money for it now, and I'll give you the other half when you get back for it. It's a simple fetch quest, but it's the vehicle to deal with a lot of other stuff along the way, whether it's pirates or other quest hooks coming along, or negotiating with merchants in that town, dealing with whatever, whatever problems might exist in that town. It's all things that could be connected to a very simple like, hey, go there, get the thing and come back. And then you've got the whole situation of when they do bring it back. Well, maybe by that point they're wealthy because of the other adventures and uh, they make they present themselves well and the noble invites them to come to the wedding too and then they get to partake in the newly gathered banana wine and watch every all the other guests kind of learn how learn this new taste and enjoy that moment and, and then there can be some drama happening as someone finds out that they're allergic to bananas the hard way uh, so there's a bunch of different adventuring things that we can kind of bring into in in looking at new foods and new ways to drink things and, uh, and new new forms of looking at stuff so that's kind of the the crux of the whole thing is finding ways to take what we already know what we're familiar with in our modern day insert them into your fantasy in such a way to make them new again and make them fun and and do it in a way that we can connect it to the adventure so that getting the thing you know, getting that new exotic drink, getting that green tea latte, getting that, um, you know, mocha frappuccino or whatever it is, you know, banana wine, mead, 
Uh, I can't believe I haven't mentioned mead yet. Mead is another powerful drink and wonderful drink with so much history and, and concepts behind it. And there's a lot of folklore surrounding mead, including the reason why we call it a honeymoon is connected to mead and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of things that are connected to the drinks that we drink that can be used to enhance our adventures. And they can, they're just thoughts to help us make our worlds feel a little more lived in, a little more fun, and maybe a little bit more familiar too. Thank you for joining me for this talk. I know this might have been a bit longer than my last two, hopefully not too much longer. I can't actually see the, the clock, so I can't tell you yet. But I hope you enjoyed it. I hope there's some useful information. And if you liked the video, please let me know, you know, give me a like and if you enjoyed the video, excuse me, and maybe a comment down below. Let me know if, if there's, you know, things in here that you would like to know more about or, or uh, if there's an idea you'd like to see me discuss in a future video, something you want, you know, want me to get more specific on that I maybe didn't get specific on in, in this one. Uh, for a future video, I'm thinking about discussing desserts and sweet things uh, and how we could maybe relate some of that to uh, our fantasy medieval renaissance era games. Um, that could be a possibility. And I really am not sure. I mean, these, these Let's Talk series, this Let's Talk series has been really fun and easy for me to do. I've enjoyed it, but there's a lot of topics that could be potentially covered. So I'm going to kind of Give a think and see what could come next. If you have suggestions and thoughts, let me know. Otherwise, I hope you all have a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend, and peace be with you. Bye-bye now.